Okay, in the previous lecture we had looked at a door, and that door had a length, let's just say this had a characteristic length of one meter, okay? And so uh, I'm also going to give us a little bit more information and say that it also had a mass of 30 kilograms. So if we measured this door, it had a mass of 30 kilograms. And to give you an explanation of this, let's just say it was a, a nice solid wooden door. I'm sorry, not wooden, let's say that this was a solid metal door, okay? And we had a 30 kilogram mass, a length of one meter, and these were the parameters we got out, and we noticed that if we took R times F, we always got one-tenth of the value. So R times F divided by 10 would give us what alpha was. So if I rewrite that, R times F divided by 10 gave us alpha every single time. The question is, why 10? What causes this number to be 10? What about its properties gives us an indication that we're going to have a 10 here. So what we're going to do is we're going to have to look at a different door. There's just too much stuff going on. So this door is going to be much like the previous door, only twice as long. And we're going to, once again, apply our force to the edge of it. And to give you the full thing here, so our R will equal L, which equals 2 meters now. And we're going to do much the same thing that we did before. Uh, so what we'll do is I'll make another table, and we'll make this one blue. And I'll do F and R and alpha for uh, this set. And this is door 2. And door 2 has some defining characteristics of its own. It's 2 meters long, as I said. But it's a wooden door, solid wooden door. So this is solid metal. This is solid wood. And as a result of it, of that difference in materials, it's actually exactly the same mass. Um, and this is obviously for comparison purposes. It's going to make it a little bit easier for us to see what's going on. So we have this, this thing that has the same amount of mass. And we're actually applying our force twice as far out, which means that our torque is going to be twice as great. So we're going to get a torque from door 2 will equal for the same amount of force. So for the same force, will equal twice the torque that we'd get from um, door one. And so let's just see what we get out as a result. So if we have our 10 Newton force that we apply at two meters away, we get an alpha out of one half. And if I follow this through, and we do this one at uh, two meters out, we get an alpha of one. This is extraordinarily vexing. And let's just do one more. If I do back to the 10, but I, I go back to the original um, lever arm that we had used previously, <laughs> granted this door's a lot bigger, right? So when I do it at one meter out, I'm not at the edge of the door like I was with door number one. I'm only part way through. So what ends up happening is we get an angular acceleration of one quarter. Well, this isn't working out very well because it seems like our alpha twos are equaling one half of our alpha ones in spite of the fact that our torque quantity is twice as big. So with twice as much torque, we should be getting twice as much twisting out of this, right? But it turns out that we're, it seems like we're getting half as much twisting. We're getting half as much change in motion. So what could be causing this? And it turns out that if we think about this carefully, at what's going on, this R is accounting for it. Not the R in the torque, but the R in the length of it when we have to consider how much mass we're trying to move. And this gets down to the whole idea of, of really what's going on, where if I look at this door, or any particular door really, there are particles at the end, at the edge of it. In order for these particles to go through an angle, they have to actually cover a pretty great distance in a short amount of time. Whereas the particles that are down here barely have to go anywhere at all in order to still go through the same angle. And actually, I undercut this one. This one has to go even further than that. So we see that we need a really large change in the motion of an object at the edge and only a small change in the motion um, towards the pivot point. And so that extra length of the door, even though it has the same mass, and even in spite of the fact that we're applying our force further out, so we should be getting a bigger torque, we're getting a lesser change in the angular motion. And so what we would get out 
is if I if I set this up a little bit more uh, carefully here, where I have R F equals I one times alpha, and I look at this, I get my I one equals ten, and if I look at this one over here, and I'm calling it for I for for really no particular reason other than that it's convenient for me to do so. <laughs> my I two I find is equal to 20, right? I can get 20 as my product out here. Actually, it's it's worse than that, isn't it? If I get... Do, 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 I think I might have made a little error in my calculations here. Hold on one moment. All right, I've checked my numbers, and it, it does look right. I don't know what I was saying, but it panicked for a moment. thought I might have been using the wrong numbers. But what we get here is we get 20 now for this quantity, so it's twice as big as it was when I had 10 and 1 because we're further out, but we're getting half as much angular acceleration out. So it appears then that our I2 is, is much, much larger now because we, we had 20 divided by 1 half, so I has gone up to 40. Now when we see something like this, a pattern like this, we have to look at the thing that we changed. Well, we changed the length of the door. We didn't change the mass. We didn't change our forces. We just changed the length of the door. Um, and where we applied the force seems to correlate fine. Um, we're, we're continuing to get the right ratio. So this is one half of this one, this is one half of that one, and so on. So we're continually getting out one half of the acceleration that we had previously. And we're continually getting out the value of 40 for this I2, whereas we were getting one out before. So the only thing that's really changed is L. And how do you go from getting a one, really, to getting a four? And what it turns out is that this I, for, for doors in general, would be one-third m l squared. And we can check this out. If I do this for a length of 1, I would get one-third of 30, because I was using a mass of 30, times 1 squared, which equals 10. And this is kilograms meter squared. If, on the other hand, I do it for this door, door number 2, I would have one-third of 30 times 2 squared, which is... 40 kilograms meters squared. So it's not helping us terribly that, that we have a longer lever arm, although it's preventing the loss from being even greater. But basically, by having stuff out, so this was our original door, everything to this side was the original door, and this is the part that's the new door. If you look at this, with the original door, we had this little bit, this stuff down here, that barely had to move at all. And the biggest, the most mass that actually had to ever move any anywhere only had to move this far. With the old door, I'm sorry, with the new door, half of the mass has to move on average twice as far as the mass had to move in the first case. Let me try to express this a little bit more clearly. So the average motion of the mass, you might say, was from here to here. Great. Now what we've done is we've taken the mass, and we've moved it much further out. So now our average, the average um, distance that the new mass, and, and bear in mind that this isn't actually new mass, we've just spread it out, but because of the this addition, the, the new amount of mass that's further out now has to move through a much greater distance. In fact, it has to move through not just twice as great of a distance, but three times as great of a distance. Uh, so this is a really big deal we have a lot of our mass moving through a much greater distance than it was before, on average. And that accounts for this much harder, or much larger, resistance to change in motion. And that's really what the moment of inertia is. It's a resistance to change in motion, but specifically it's a resistance to change in angular motion. Um, now, if we get down to the nitty-gritty of it, we could just analyze this in terms of every single point of mass. We could look at every little bit of point of mass, and we could analyze its change in linear motion. Uh, and we could base that all off of four f equals m times a. But that's not the smart move. Uh, that's not the best way for us to go about doing this. Our best bet is to treat it as a system of objects going through the same angle, but recognizing that the parts that are further out, while they're going through the same angle, actually have to change their motion a lot more. So our moment of inertia becomes much, much higher as a result of that. Uh, what we're going to do in the next video lecture is uh, just take a quick look at energy, the effect of energy on moment of inertia, 
And then I'll have one more lecture involving moment of inertia after that. And hopefully that should be sufficient to make moment of inertia pretty, pretty easy and clear for you.